Welcome and uh, yes, thank you for uh, making the time uh, to join us today in this uh, uh, webinar about uh, uh, LODA, the Linked Open Data Aggregator. This uh, webinar is organized under the uh, Common Culture Generic Project uh, Activity 6 that uh, supports capacity building in the uh, Europana ecosystem. Uh, my name is Adina from Europana Foundation and I'll be introducing uh, today's uh, uh, speakers. I'll be moderating the, the session today and uh, questions and uh, discussions uh, at the end. Um, I'm here with, um, with my colleague Tamara, who is overseeing that, uh, yes, the technology works for us. If there are any uh, problems, just uh, uh, let us know in the chat or, um, or otherwise. Um, and uh, yeah, before we start, I would like to mention that um, all participants are muting, muted uh, automatically at uh, entrance. Uh, if you want to interact with us, uh, you can do it via the chat function or the Q&A section. Um, and uh, yeah, in case you would like to uh, pose your questions out loud, uh, please raise your hand or let us know uh, otherwise uh, and then uh, we will make sure that uh, uh, you are unmuted so you'll be able to, to speak. Um, also, um, yeah, time-wise, uh, we aim to stick within the um, one-hour frame, but if there are questions or discussions that require more explanation, we will um, yeah, be available to run slightly over the hour. And uh, yeah, remember that um, <clears throat> this uh, um, session is recorded and will be made available uh, afterwards for uh, everyone that registered and uh, on pro. So um, yes, we will be sharing some uh, um, some links in the chat um, uh, later about this. And uh, yeah, we we would uh, really like if you could. Um, um, fill in the webinar survey to let us know what uh, you thought of uh, the session and what we can uh, improve. Uh, and now, um, yes, I'll be introducing our speakers today. We are here with uh, uh, Shores uh, de Falk uh, from the Dutch Digital Heritage Network uh, or in Dutch uh, NDE. Um, Shores is part of the uh, Usable Digital Heritage uh, Work Program uh, at NDE and is responsible for the design of, of linked data services that allow uh, Dutch heritage institutions to connect with uh, their information and that enable users to find this information more easily. And uh, with uh, Enno uh, Myers from uh, Dutch National Library and uh, Dutch Digital Heritage Network. Um, Enno works at the research department uh, in the Dutch National Library, um, the KB. The KB is <clears throat> uh, one of the partners uh, in the uh, Dutch Digital Heritage Network. And uh, at uh, NDE, Enno is leading the uh, Usable Digital Heritage uh, uh, Work Program. A major part of this uh, work program uh, is about improving the interoperability of cultural heritage information by implementing linked data technologies and uh, services. So uh, yes, gentlemen, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please uh, start. Thank you very much, Adina, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm going to start uh, this part of the presentation, but first, I always like to look at old pictures. That's basically cultural heritage in a nutshell. For example, this picture from the Technical Museum from Sweden, I guess. Uh, there's this Toledo scale that you can see in the, in the center. Um, with two smart looking gentlemen uh, looking at this uh, scale. Um, this Toledo scale is from the Toledo Scale Corporation, a provider for advanced weighing systems uh, for use in industrial applications. And it looks rather fitting for our subject uh, today. It's, it's a bit technical, um, but very, very interesting, uh, I, I think. Uh, one thing I noticed when looking at this picture is there are quite a number of uh, references to Toledo, the, the manufacturer. 
everywhere. I'm not sure if you can count them, but uh, I've found four references. Uh, so here uh, in this, at the top, Toledo. Uh, there's one here in the center. I'm not sure if you're able to view this, Toledo. There's one, again, on this typing machine thing, Toledo. And there's, of course, one at the bottom, the Toledo scale. So four references. This looks like a brand picture to me. Also, uh, quite interesting, again, ah, this is the, the funny thing of looking at old pictures. There's this slogan, um, honest weight. So this, yeah, you're probably not able to read it, but honest weight. So this is per probably the mission of the, of the corporation. Um, I would like to talk about um, three things. Uh, the context in which we uh, developed uh, uh, LODA. Uh, also, who we are as uh, the Dutch Digital Heritage Network, and what exactly is this LODA thing? Uh, why have we developed this, it, uh, uh, and how does it work? Uh, next, uh, the second part of the presentation, Anna will take over and will guide us through LODA and uh, show us a bit of the software and the well te technical foundation uh, of LODA. Uh, first, a small bit of context. Why have we, in what, what's the con what is the context in which we have developed uh, LODA? That's, of course, Europeana Common Culture, as Edina already introduced. Uh, common Culture aims to develop a harmonized and coordinated environment for Europeana's uh, national aggregators. Uh, you can find more information about uh, the project uh, online. Uh, but the most important thing is probably uh, there's a small reference to what we're doing. Uh, that is, uh, on the website you'll find information or just one sentence that says, uh, concrete pilots on linked data demonstrate innovation in aggregation. So this is one small segment of uh, common culture. And basically, this is us. This is Loda. Uh, we are a pilot, a concrete pilot. Um, next up, who are we actually? Uh, we are the Dutch Digital Heritage Network, NDE. Small, small introduction uh, if you're not familiar with uh, NDE. Uh, we uh, have been founded in 2015 at the initiative of the Dutch Ministry of Education, Culture and Science. And uh, the Dutch Digital Heritage Network is a partnership of various uh, very, very small to very, very large cultural heritage institutions in the Netherlands, ranging from uh, local heritage uh, associations to uh, our national uh, library and the national archives. Um, we uh, aim to develop a system of national facilities and services for improving the uh, so-called visibility, usability, and sustainability of the Dutch digital heritage. Uh, there's a great, great uh, line underneath it. We aim to increase the public value of the collections held by the Dutch archives, libraries, museums, and other institutions that uh, uh, have uh, cultural heritage collections. Uh, so, this Dutch Digital Heritage Network, we aim to develop this system of services and there are three keywords that, well, more or less identify our work. Um, and the first key word is that we, uh, are, uh, uh, we aim to create this usable uh, network, this usable heritage information network. Work, uh, at the source and with at the source we mean that the cultural heritage institutions in our network uh, are the core of what we're doing uh, we uh, uh, the, 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 in the various in, uh, institutions that there are in the Netherlands and uh, that's where the experts live and that is where the people work that know their data so so it makes quite a lot of sense to us uh, to empower these individual institutions to publish their cultural heritage information to the best of their abilities. Uh, practically, there's also another reason why we um, uh, make this uh, source so important. Uh, that is, our network is too large and too diverse. Uh, to create or to structure ourselves at some overarching na national level. Uh, so it's rather important uh, that the various individual institutions from very small to very, very large uh, um, have the capacity to publish their information themselves. So in order to get this 
to get to, to this so-called distributed network where each uh, institution publishes its own uh, uh, cultural heritage information, uh, we need uh, something. And that is technical and semantic interoperability. Uh, for example, we need to agree on metadata standards uh, that we can use for publishing our data. And we need to agree on certain technology standards that we can use so that our various applications uh, can uh, connect to each other and share information. And in order to achieve this technical and semantic interoperability, we need something else. Uh, that is linked data. And uh, linked data is our well, methodology, our weapon of, of choice, if you like, uh, for publishing information and for connecting the various sources uh, to each other uh, so that the cultural heritage information of our institutions becomes more useful, becomes more interlinked, becomes more connected. Uh, to clarify this a little bit, I'm not quite sure uh, to what extent you know linked data, so just a brief, brief example. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, print uh, from the collection of the uh, National Library of the Netherlands. This is um, a, a board game. Um, it's called in Dutch the Franse Koningenspel, or in English, the Game of French Kings. Um, it's uh, hardly, hardly visible, but uh, someone uh, mentioned who is depicted in the center. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to increase this a little bit. Yeah, I'm not sure about your Dutch, but my Dutch is, well, pretty okay. It says here, uh, depicted are uh, Kaiser Napoleon the Derde, which is Emperor Napoleon the Third. Uh, with his uh, family. Uh, so this is the uh, game of French uh, kings. Important, uh, this is the, the actual print. Uh, the print also has metadata. Uh, and this uh, CHO, this cultural heritage object, this print, has metadata. And this metadata first has an identifier. This is uh, this URI. So if you take this URI, uh, copy and paste it into your browser, you can find more information about this uh, print. This URI is fundamental uh, because it is a unique identifier and you can use it to look up information about this uh, cultural heritage object. Um, second, uh, there is also, of course, metadata attached to this uh, object. For example, uh, the name uh, of the print, Game of uh, French Kings. The publisher, uh, Gangel et Didion, uh, this, that's my attempt at speaking uh, French, uh, and the day that, uh, at, what, at, at which it was created, somewhere, it's in Dutch, somewhere between 1828 and uh, 1851. Uh, these are statements about this cultural heritage object. Uh, that is, uh, this uh, print has a name. This print has a publisher. This print has a date at which it was created. These are so-called so statements, or in linked data, RDF statements to resource description uh, framework, which you can use for making, well, uh, very basic claims about cultural heritage. Uh, the third thing uh, that I would like to mention about linked data is the vocabulary. Um, and the National Library uses schema.org as its vocabulary for publishing this uh, metadata. There are various uh, uh, other vocabularies available, for example, Dublin Core, as you may well know, or SCOS, or the Europeana Data Model, EDM, is also a vocabulary. Um, so there are various uh, vocabularies available that you can use for publishing your uh, metadata. Uh, this is my very brief introduction to uh, linked data, and I've just mentioned three core statements that I'll use uh, later on, the URI, REF statements, and vocabulary. Next up, um, we are the Dutch Digital Heritage Network, but what is the link uh, between the Dutch Digital Heritage, Net Heritage Network and uh, Common Culture and LODA, the, the, this thing that we've uh, developed, together with, uh, uh, let's not forget, other national aggregators in Europe as well. The, our link is Digitale Collectie, or Digital Collection in English, that's the national aggregator from the Netherlands, as you may well be aware of. Um, the Digitale Collectie is operated by the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision. Some of my colleagues are also available uh, in this uh, webinar. 
Um, and since 2015, uh, the Digitale Collectie is part of the Dutch Digital Heritage Network. Uh, Adina already mentioned, National Library uh, is, is a partner in the Dutch Digital Heritage Network, but the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision is a partner in the same network as well, and actually uh, uh, was the project lead of uh, Loda. Uh, so, this is a very brief introduction to, uh, to, to us, basically, uh, but what about LODA? LODA is this linked open data aggregator, but what is it ex exactly? Um, first, why have we developed LODA? And there are two perspectives uh, on this. Uh, we noticed that there are, uh, is an increasing number of institutions that want to publish their cultural heritage information as linked to open data. Uh, and they may want to use EDM, the European Data Model, for publishing their information, but they also might want to use other vocabularies for publishing, uh, for publishing their information. So, um, EDM is well suited uh, for this kind of information, but there are other vocabularies available as well that institutions may want to use. For example, schema.org, I've already mentioned it. Uh, it's quite useful if you would like uh, Google to index your information and to understand what you're, uh, what you're publishing. Uh, so EDM uh, may be well suited, but there are other vocabularies as well. Second uh, thing is the perspective from Europeana. Europeana is interested in more flexible ways for institutions to deliver, to deliver their data to Europeana, including data that doesn't use EDM. Uh, currently, uh, you must use EDM for publishing information uh, to, to Europeana, but uh, as mentioned before, other vocabularies may be well suited too. Uh, Europeana with LODA wants to explore the possibilities uh, there. And the third uh, point there, uh, also from the perspective of Europeana, is that uh, if more and more institutions start to use linked data uh, and they actually publish their information themselves using vocabularies of their choice, uh, they can actually publish richer information. Uh, because they can choose their own vocabulary, they can, they can choose the, the vocabulary that, that best fits their data. Uh, and interestingly, if you choose your own vocabulary uh, and you send your data using that vocabulary to Europeana, Europeana also re receives richer data, which is, of course, quite an advantage to uh, Europeana. So this is the reason why we've developed uh, LODA. Uh, to, uh, display this in a more graphical form. Uh, there's this institution A and B uh, that share a common national aggregator. Uh, they both deliver their information in EDM to the national aggregator, and the national aggregator sends this information to Europeana, again, using EDM, the current situation. So what we're looking for with LODA is the desired situation. Uh, where institutions can still choose, of course, to publish their information with EDM, send it to their national aggregator, and then to Europeana. But also, uh, if an institution wants to use a different vocabulary than EDM, uh, he or she can do so. For example, uh, with LODA, you can publish your information using schema or some other vocabulary of your choice. Uh, this is where uh, the interesting part uh, happens. Uh, if you publish your information using schema, and then some kind of conversion has to occur at some point, uh, uh, if you would like to send your information to Europeana next. Um, because schema is, of course, a different vocabulary than EDM, so we'll have to find some way to convert this vocabulary to EDM, which, of course, still is and, and will be the, the, the vocabulary that Europeana uses for processing your data. So we need some kind of conversion. And that's basically LODA. LODA is some kind of conversion. Um, or to put it a little bit more formally, uh, LODA is a generic tool set for harvesting data uh, from institutions and for transforming this data uh, into EDM, ready for ingesting by Europeana. 
Um, there are three design principles uh, uh, in play for LoDA. The first one is that LoDA uses uh, uh, common linked data practices. And this is basically all the stuff that I've explained previously. That is, you should use your eyes to identify your heritage information. Uh, you, you should use web standards uh, such, such as uh, RDF. And you should use common vocabularies for structuring uh, your data. So nothing new, really. Uh, the second one is that Loda uses standard tools. That is, uh, we don't have the time or the money to develop our own tools. Uh, we're cultural heritage institutions, we're a network. Uh, so we want to reuse what all the others have created before us. And there are some awesome tools available. Uh, so this is a so-called proven technology that we want to use for Loda. And the third principle is that Loda should be easy to configure for your own situation. And with your, your own, I mean you as a national aggregator. So if there is an institution in your network that doesn't use EDM but some other vocabulary, you need some kind of conversion, uh, that is LODA, uh, to get from this source vocabulary to the target vocabulary uh, EDM. And we want to make it easy to do so because, well, we're not IT companies. Uh, uh, we want to make it very, very comfortable for you to do so. This is also um, a bit of a proof of concept for us uh, if we can achieve this using LoDA. So how does LoDA work, uh, actually? Um, there are two perspectives to this story, the perspective of an institution and the perspective of a national aggregator. So very briefly, uh, as an institution, uh, if you want to publish your heritage information uh, with some kind of vocabulary that is not EDM, there are three things you should do. Uh, the first thing is that you should publish your metadata about your cultural heritage objects uh, using resolvable URIs that lead to RDF uh, and with a schema of your choice. So this means that each individual object, for example, the, the game of French Kings, uh, is resolvable uh, online, has its own identifier. Uh, the second thing that you should do is that you should publish your data set, um, and meaning your data set uh, can contain the entire uh, metadata of your cultural heritage objects in a data dump, or you could publish a data set using just the URIs of your cultural heritage objects, or you can use a Sparkle endpoint uh, for publishing uh, your information. Um, and uh, the third thing that you should do is that you should make available a data set description uh, of your data set. This description makes clear how your data set can be accessed. And the data, data description basically is a tiny, tiny bit of information that makes clear how others uh, can access your data set. So it's, it's basically metadata about your metadata. Um, and I'm not sure if you've heard about this before, but there are various vocabularies available for, for uh, uh, publishing data descriptions, such as DCAT or VOID or even uh, schema.org. These are three things that you can do as an institution to publish heritage information with a different vocabulary uh, than EDM. The next perspective is that of a national aggregator. So if you are a national aggregator uh, and you want to harvest or get information from one of your institutions that doesn't use EDM, you can install LoDA. Um, and uh, what LoDA does basically, first thing is that LoDA, as soon as, you, as, soon as you've installed it, fetches uh, the data the description of the institution that uses another vocabulary than, than EDM. LoDA then finds out how it can access the data set or the cultural heritage objects in your data set. Uh, and this is where it really gets interesting because LoDA is now uh, able to harvest uh, the, your data set, the data set of this institution, based on the information uh, uh, described in the data set description. Uh, so uh, now Loda has retrieved your data set, uh, created a, a copy really of it, and uh, the third thing that Loda then can do is map that data set from a source vocabulary such as schema.org to a target vocabulary such as EDM. 
And this is called mapping. You've, of course, heard it all before. But what Aloda does internally is uh, it creates uh, for each property in your cultural heritage object and mapping from one thing to another. Uh, for example, uh, schema name. Uh, this example uses the, the uh, Game of French Kings example from the National Library of the Netherlands. Uh, uh, the metadata of this cultural heritage object uses schema name for naming uh, the thing. Uh, schema name is not a property that is a part of EDM. Uh, DC title, uh, however, is. So you can create a, a mapping from one property, schema name, to another property that is recognized by Europeana DC title. Uh, and so on and so forth for all the other properties of your cultural heritage uh, object. Uh, what Loda does here is it uses Sparkle construct queries for uh, creating this mapping. Uh, this is a W3C uh, standard, the World Wide Web Consortium standard. And it's quite, it may sound intimidating, but it's actually quite easy uh, to uh, create a mapping from one vocabulary to another with Sparkle construct queries. Uh, the next thing that Loda does, and now it has created a mapping of your data set, um, it uh, wants to validate this data set. So uh, a mapping has occurred from the source uh, data set to a target data set. Um, and for this validation, uh, uh, Loda uh, makes sure that the result of the mapping is actual valid EDM Otherwise, it uh, will be, of course, refused by uh, Europeana during its ingest process. So for this validation, uh, it's a uh, load to make sure that you have an EDM type, for example, is it a text object or an image or a video? It's uh, make sure that there is at least a DC title or a DC description, uh, and it makes sure that the DC title is not empty. So these are basic rules that you can uh, uh, make part of LODA uh, for ensuring the quality of your uh, mapping. Uh, LODA underneath uses the shapes constraint language, again a W3C standard or shekel in, in short for uh, data validation. Uh, and this uh, makes sure uh, that uh, uh, with Shepard, you can basically define a bunch of conditions uh, uh, and your data set must comply to these conditions. So the result, step four, also the final step, is that Loda has um, retrieved your, uh, a data set description of one of your institutions. It has harvested uh, the actual data set of that institution. It has mapped that data set from uh, the institution's vocabulary to EDM. Uh, and now it's ready to deliver this data set, this mapped data set, uh, to Europeana for further processing. Important to know um, is that this, uh, this, this process loader does not change the way Europeana uh, uh, ingests its, its data. Uh, the end result of LODA is valid EDM uh, ready for further processing by Europeana, but Europeana doesn't have to change anything in its ingest process here. Um, so this is my part of the story. Uh, next up is Enno for some practicalities about uh, about Laura. Thank you, George, for uh, this excellent uh, introduction to uh, to Laura. Um, let me share my screen. Yeah, the next in the next part, uh, I will show what we really uh, did with the software and uh, how we ran the test and, and what the results were. And then I will end with a, a very small uh, outlook for the next steps uh, we are thinking about uh, doing with this tool. Um, in general, for everybody who is really interested in the details, I would um, advise everybody to go to the uh, our GitHub uh, page. Uh, it will be in the links uh, uh, as well uh, with this information from this webinar. And uh, we really spent uh, uh, 
quite some effort in uh, building up uh, documentation in this GitHub as well. So it's not only the software, it is uh, uh, a lot of documentation you can find there. And uh, especially, and that is where I'll start this part, um, is also uh, we documented the results of all the different tests we did. And um, as this common culture project, we uh, we did it together with an, a number of uh, other national aggregators also involved in the common culture project. Um, and um, there were basically two roles. There were a, a group of uh, aggregators uh, provided uh, data and uh, the colleagues from Finland and Greece uh, um, we're in development sessions uh, together with us in order to think about which way to really uh, approach the system. And um, these are all the data sets uh, we processed with, with LODA. Uh, it was from uh, uh, the Greek National Aggregator from uh, several couple of data sets from the Dutch Digital Heritage Network. Uh, data set from the National Library of Port Portugal, the, from the Finnish National Library, and uh, that, um, we also uh, did a, a test run with uh, several sets from the Swedish National Heritage Board. Um, as you can see here, we documented uh, uh, all the different aspects uh, of, of uh, running the test. You can see the, uh, for instance, the, the, the number of triples contained in the data set that we uh, uh, aggregated and you see there were very uh, different sizes. And of course, uh, we were interested in uh, not only see it run smoothly on small data sets, but of course also on uh, really nice large data sets like the Finna who ended up with a 4.4 gigabyte uh, data value to convert. Um, to start over there, uh, <laughs> We used a, a, a Sparkle query to find all the links that needed to be uh, to crawl. Eh? One of the three uh, options uh, you can point out in the data set description uh, how you can collect all the data. And uh, that actually uh, ran for almost seven hours <laughs> before it completed. Um, so that was really uh, time consuming and it's basically because it has to do uh, really uh, a lot of Sparkle queries over and over again in order to get all the data out there. So uh, I must say in the end, the conversion there, so the mapping itself, uh, after uh, we had downloaded the data set, uh, the conversion itself was really uh, quite smooth, actually. It, it, it ran uh, uh, quite nice even. Uh, if you consider this had been done uh, in a tool set that runs in memory and and uh, that run without any problems. Um, if you see, uh, there are a, a lot of links in here. If we zoom in a little bit on uh, um, one of the data sets we aggregated, then you see that this, uh, this test run is documented as well. And, and here you see the different steps we actually did. So. Um, the, the software itself uh, contains of uh, an, a number of uh, scripts that, that uh, need to be run for the different steps. And the first step is uh, crawling the data uh, and you point the script at a, at a certain URI where the data set description lives. So it's the metadata about the metadata that Shors pointed out that is defined in the URI. Um, and the crawler reads that and then starts uh, collecting all the data it can find through the data set description and it outputs it to uh, in triple cell uh, with a name. Um, it is possible to validate the data set description itself and then you can see if it uh, complies to the uh, to the few rules there are for, for describing a data set description. Um, the next step is mapping the data, and uh, here you see that, that it takes the, uh, the downloaded file, 
uh, it takes, and this is actually an option, it takes a, a query as an option. So that's through the, the construct query that Shores was talking about, and it results in the output. And normally, if you don't specify the query, then it just does a standard conversion from schema to EDM. And um, um, basically, that runs without, uh, uh, by default, uh, quite good, actually. And normally, we can. If it's, if it's a regular schema description of the data, then we can just process it with the standard query. Uh, this is actually something that happened here uh, that needed an, uh, a slight adjustment of the construct query. And that is something that we run into basically every data set that there are uh, data problems. And that's nothing new, of course. The data doesn't change. Uh, just because we run a different tool, uh, data problems are always in there. And in, in, uh, in fact, in this case, uh, we needed to uh, do a little fix on the data because the, uh, the, the Unicode was not properly encoded in the RDF. And that is something we could, we could fix on this side. Normally, you would also, of course, do this in the source data and, and fix it over there. But this is flexible enough to, uh, to adjust it. And then there's a validation step of, uh, of the results. So you can uh, see if it's really uh, if, uh, valid EDM uh, that can be processed by Europeana. And in order to deliver it, and there's a last step. And there was actually something uh, we had to add at the end of, uh, of the work, actually, in order to uh, rewrite the standard XML RDF that's being generated into uh, the XML that Europeana has to process. And uh, I must say, it was a, a kind of a surprise for me that we needed to do this step, but we, uh, we could work this out as well. Um, This is a small description. Uh, it's documented uh, uh, the intermediate files that, that were uh, used in this process. Uh, they're also in the GitHub when they're not too big actually to store. Um, and so there's also the uh, construct query that is being used for this conversion I was just uh, telling you about. And uh, this is the... the the extra part we put in here in order to fix the uh, the Unicode characters. So, if you provided the uh, data, please have a look at uh, at the description of the test here, and uh, and see what we run into. Especially the uh, um, we described the problems in the data, the fixes we uh, we had to do for that, and uh, of course the results. Um, if we go back to this slide again, if we look at the data itself. This is a, a small screenshot of one of the records from the data set we were looking at. And you see here, this is a very uh, a nice scheme.org uh, way of uh, describing the data. And th uh, after the conversion with the Sparkle query, we end up with uh, uh, the aggregation level and the CHO level with the Europeana properties that uh, probably look familiar to you. Um, we ran also, although it was not in scope of the pilot, we did run uh, tests with the results in order to see if they, we can in, we could ingest them into uh, into Metis. And actually, uh, that. Uh, worked quite well after discovering that we needed to uh, comply to the XML rules. Uh, but further on, we, we could uh, uh, process a number of, uh, of data sets. Um, and we also did a test with the, another common culture project to result, uh, the sandbox, in order to see if we could uh, upload it to the sandbox and see what the results were. And, um, we could process it even without uh, problems, but we still were, uh, there was too little time to really uh, even, uh, 
evaluate the results. Uh, there were some question marks still in the results. This is basically uh, what we have documented in, in the GitHub. So uh, again, if, if uh, you have touched, if you have provided uh, data to uh, for the lot aggregator project, please have a look over here and, and see uh, what we did with it and, and uh, what the results were. Uh, we go back to the uh, root directory of the, of the repository. Uh, then I would like to point out to two uh, documents that specify uh, how we expect to the data uh, to be uh, published. One of them is uh, about the data description. So if you have a data set and you want to publish a data description, then uh, you can uh, read about the, the requirements uh, for that description. So please have a look at it if you want to publish uh, data that way. And the other one is uh, in general, how to model your data in schema.org uh, in order to be compliant with uh, the trans transformation to, to EDM. So if you want to publish data in schema.org from it, there are certain uh, things you need to take in account in order to be uh, um, compliant with, with the way uh, Europeana looks at data. So there are certain uh, requirements in there. They've been uh, both uh, specified and uh, this is work that uh, Nuno Freire did uh, uh, like uh, um, other documentation as well and uh, Please have a look at it and, and give us feedback if you see any, any uh, problems with it or have uh, additional information for us. In general, and I'll be brief in case of, uh, because we are uh, almost on, uh, <laughs> at the end of the time slot we had for, for this webinar, I think. Um, the installation itself is uh, is documented, uh, of course, as well in in the uh, in the GitHub here. Um, it is based on is uh, fully on uh, Docker and Docker containers. So there's actually uh, you don't uh, apart from Docker, you don't need to install additional tools. You can just run the commands uh, following uh, the description that has been uh, that is in here. Um, and in general, like I showed in the test data, it's a uh, number of steps with different commands. It's about crawling the data, it's about mapping the data, it's validating the data set and converting it. And uh, the specific options are documented uh, in this documentation as well. For the really technical people, uh, I would advise to have a look at the scripts uh, that are in the bin directory. And, and uh, if you're a little bit uh, knowledgeable about how to build base scripts, then uh, you, you can find your way around to see what happens. Um, the only source code we used was for the crawler and, and the converter that is actually being built uh, together with, uh, with Nuno Freire as well, with, with uh, Europeana R&D. Um, and they all, uh, the crawler uh, runs in a Docker as well, so in, in, uh, on the command level, it just is all, uh, they're just commands that can be run. Um, in the queries, uh, you find some uh, uh, some other queries uh, used for for doing the conversion. The default one is schema uh, to EDM, uh, and for certain sets, like I showed for with the Greek data set as well, uh, we need to, we had to adjust the query, and sometimes uh, the input data was not even uh, not in schema but in a different uh, uh, vocabulary. So we needed to do another. Uh, built an, another mapping query, and uh, I can completely agree with uh, with George that, that writing Sparkle 
construct queries when you a little bit into Sparkle, then then it's not very difficult, and it's uh, it's it's a it's a standard uh, mapping link of query language as well. So if you know the syntax, then uh, you can get you can find your way around quite easily. So please have a look at it if you're interested. Um, let us know if you have uh, issues, uh, um, if you want to run the software yourself and do tests with it. Um, you can uh, create issues in the, uh, in the repository or uh, send us uh, an email and let us know what, your, um, uh, what the results are. So finally, what is next? What are we going to do uh, uh, in the future with this? Um, for one thing, um, like George told us, uh, we have a connection to Digital Collexi yeah, from the Science and Vision Institute. And uh, we decided to, uh, together with NDE that we will uh, investigate the possibility of running this service as an additional service in 2021. Uh, together with uh, the Sound and Vision Institute uh, as a service of uh, digital collection. Um, we will do further investigation in this pipeline to see if uh, if we want to end up with the, the, the several the separate uh, commands put together in order to build a pipeline, or maybe switch to to a complete application and since the whole tool set is based on, on the Jena uh, tools, uh, they're also available as, as a Java library. So switching to a tool, uh, a complete application that runs uh, Java commands um, is actually quite easily. Uh, so, but we want to investigate what will be the best way to, uh, to develop it further and, and, and make it production ready. Um, we need to discuss uh, with uh, uh, with Europeana how we do the uh, the ingest process into Metis. Uh, we did some experiments uh, with it, and we, basically um, the result is the, is the basic result of an aggregated delivering uh, data to Europeana. But we can um, it is interesting to do some pre testing, and that's uh, why we were also interested in. Uh, running with the uh, test with the sandbox in order to see if that we could develop a process in order to get more feedback easily. Yeah. So those are the things we're thinking about uh, at this moment. For now, the project uh, uh, is concluded. We, we, we finished the project. Um, there's uh, Nuno and I am a number of people uh, together with us. We wrote a, a paper about the results of, uh, of this project, uh, and it will be presented uh, uh, on the Conference on Metadata and Semantics Research uh, in, uh, in November this year. So uh, please have a look at the paper if you are interested in the details. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Eno. Thank you, Shores. Um, there were a couple of questions. Um, one of them, uh, actually the first one, uh, came uh, during uh, Shores' part and uh, um, is about, uh, I think it, it was uh, when you were mentioning schema.org and Google indexing or something. Is that really true about schema.org and Google indexing? Uh, Stefan says that uh, that's not the case in general. Uh, if you don't cater for a certain rich snippet type offered by Google. Um, and then uh, he had an additional question on the listing of URIs uh, option that comprises OAIPMH. If you support SWORT or resource sync too. Yeah. Um. Perhaps so, I can answer the first one, <laughs> yeah, or both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
the two separate questions uh, at least. Yes. Um, for the, the schema.org part, uh, to be honest, it's really, um, at least to me and to us, uh, uh, quite unclear what Google really does with the schema.org you put in your web page. Uh, we have been following this very closely. We have been experimenting uh, with it a lot. Um, there is the structured data tool that shows how Google can read your information and process it. Um, that structured data tool is now uh, moving towards a new tool that is really focused on the rich snippet uh, uh, approach. Um, but in general, schema.org is, of course, not only uh, uh, standard by Google, but it is uh, a kind of an agreement uh, for, for uh, the large search engines in order to have a standardized way of representing your information. So uh, for us, we regard it as, as, uh, as close as to uh, generic vocabulary <laughs> as you can find in order to support uh, findability, at least, in order to, to, to support uh, search. So uh, it is unclear what, what Google really does with it. Uh, it is unclear what Google will do next with it and how it will move on. But in general, we think it is a, uh, to, to me, it's quite similar uh, to EDM, only it's more generic than EDM because EDM is about the cultural heritage domain and schema is about uh, the World Wide Web uh, and how you can represent things in a generic way. Um, so that's the first part, uh, the, the first question. Yes. Um, and I think we can, there's a lot to say about this topic. <laughs> and uh, we, we probably could uh, organize a separate <laughs> webinar about this topic. <laughs> I would love to be uh, listening to that. Um, <laughs> the, the other question is about uh, OAI PMH and um, and that is something uh, interesting to, to think about because um, we are not replicating the data. We're just uh, collecting a copy of the data to process it. And with the OEI PMH and also resource sync, you really are focused on replicating the changes that happen in the data and then uh, uh, work the same changes through in, in the, the other copy you have of the data. But what we're doing is we're just getting a, a, a complete data dump as a, as a snapshot of the data and then uh, convert it and, and, and deliver it. And basically you throw away the, the previous data you had. So it's a different kind of approach than OAI PMH uh, and resource sync. Um, So I don't know if that's <laughs> a sufficient answer to that question. Uh, that's about all I can say about yes. it. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, he's happy with the answer. Um, the, the, there is a question. There was a question from, from Jesse. Um, do you envision each national aggregator to have uh, uh, its own LODA? Uh, or could it be a shared infrastructure between the national aggregators? I could envision uh, Europeana having a LODA instance <laughs> <of> running. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. So I, I, I can, uh, there's basically no limitation in, in how you want to organize this. So it, it really should be organized in the most practical way. Uh, uh, based on the kind of cooperation that's there in the network. So, and I can imagine if you start running this from the digital collection and other uh, people are interested in, in delivering the data through this route and uh, I'm quite sure that Europeana wouldn't reject that data. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that, those are things we need to work out, I think. Uh, we need to talk about these uh, things in the future. 
Okay, um, there were uh, some questions from Rob. How many vocabularies are so far mapped to EDM in the Loda pilot? Uh, what are they and what do you see uh, as the potential horizon? Uh, I think this was a bit answered with the first, uh, with this uh, question before. Yeah, and I think if you if you look at uh, the queries uh, directory in the, in the repository, there you find all uh, examples of different uh, uh, vocabularies, and um, I don't think there's actually a, a, a fixed point on the horizon where we will uh, uh, end up. Uh, what I do did notice was that you need to have a kind of a, a cultural heritage object perspective on the data that is important. And there was something I ran into with the finished uh, uh, data from the National Library. The, uh, it's modeled uh, like works and instances, and then you have to uh, get elements of the data from different levels. And, and then uh, you get quite complex queries because you need to have a part from, from one level and apart from another level, and um, if if it grows far away from the, the perspective of a cultural heritage object, then conversion will be hard, and you need to do a lot of things. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um... And the last one uh, coming from Valentin, uh, why choosing Shackle for validation compared to, uh, for instance, uh, XS XSD? Uh, did you represent all the EDM external constraints as described in the public schema with Shackle? You want to do this, sure, sir? <laughs> <laughs> no, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, choosing Shackle was kind of, uh, we actually started with Shacks, uh, to be honest. Uh, and we ended up with Shackle um, basically because the, there's better support for Shackle in, in tooling. And uh, so that is why we ended up with Shackle. Um, both are, of course, very focused on RDF. So um, it's, we're actually, it was the first time we really started using uh, Shackle, so we were interested in, in, yeah, exploring this standard. And I must say, uh, it's it's quite transparent to work with it, so so it was a positive experience. Um, I don't think we implemented all the constraints in the documentation. I must say, uh, I spent. We spent quite a lot of time in the EDM documentation, um, but there are a lot of details in there, and I think uh, th this is work we need to to uh, to build further. We need to to put more detail in there. I think um, we did look at them uh, uh, as far as as we touched it through the data. So, uh, but of course, there are a lot of things that are not reflected in the data, so we didn't really uh, look in details in the documentation and the constraints in there. So we did a part of it, but it's it's still a work in progress, I think. Um, and uh, it's, of course, it's an open repository, so please uh, send us uh, <laughs> updates on this and we will uh, integrate it. Uh, feel free to uh, to work on that. Okay, I think, uh, yes, that answers uh, all questions. Um, yes, thanks everyone for uh, participating uh, in today's session and for your questions. Um, yes, the, the recording will be shared uh, shortly after this uh, on, on PRO, um, and uh, I will uh, also share um, the, the presentations and relevant links uh, there. So, um, Adina, you're, uh, you're muted. Oh, uh, was I speaking while I was muted? <laughs> <laughs> you were. 
Okay, <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, so, again, <laughs> sorry, thanks, uh, Shores, for uh, mentioning that. Um, yes, I was mentioning that, uh, yeah, thank you for your questions and uh, participation, and that we will, uh, we will share uh, uh, the relevant documents and the recording uh, on the uh, webinar pro page. Um, yeah, uh, have a good uh, afternoon, everyone, and uh, stay safe and see you next time.